Jennings, would you state your full name for the camera? Oh, good morning. Uh, Talbert Hendricks. And what was your birth date and place of birth? I was born in Chicago, December the 31st, 1922. Today, how many today? Oh, today? Mm -hmm. oh, August the 17th? August? Yeah, 2007. Okay. You can still see it. Okay. That's good. They just wanted it in there. And your parents' names? My father's name was Henry Woods Jennings, and he was born in Yazoo City, Mississippi. My mother's name was Era Ann Brown. That was her maiden name. She was born in Chicago. Illinois. And you were born in Chicago? I was born in Chicago, Illinois. And yeah. what hospital was that? Uh, St. Luke's Hospital. And can you tell us about your family composition, brothers and sisters? Well, uh, I had two brothers, Henry Woods Jennings, Jr., and James Brown Jennings was my youngest brother, and I had a sister. I have a sister now, and that's her name is Mildred Ann uh, Jennings, her married name is Taylor. Can you uh, take us back, Mr. Jennings, and, and tell us a little bit about your early life? Well, uh, during my early life, my mother, she died when I was about seven years old. And my father had had problems when my uh, people in Mississippi, uh, that's where they lived, and um, he had a tendency to be rebellious against segregation and what went on in the South back then, and he would fight with the white boys, which was taboo in that Southern atmosphere. And uh, one day he seriously injured a white boy, and my grandmother, fearing that he might be lynched, she uh, let him have the horse and buggy and gave him money, and he went to some relatives, and they put him on a train where he went to Kansas City, where we had some other relatives. And consequently, because my grandparents could not produce him to the authorities in Yazoo City, Mississippi, their house was destroyed and they had to leave Mississippi, knowing that my father could never come back, and they migrated to Chicago. And there my father met my mother and uh, married uh, my mother, Era. And uh, consequently, they had the four children, but as as a result of uh, the conditions then, he had become an alcoholic, and um, it was difficult for him to find work, and consequently, uh, my mother developed tuberculosis shortly after my sister's birth, and she later died in a sanitarium. Well, while she was ill, we were placed with Aunt Mary, a relative who already had four children of her own, and they were temporarily fostering us and, and hoping that my mother would get well. And when she passed away, my father, having been unable to care for us because of his alcoholism, and my Aunt Mary, having four children of her own, was unable to take care of all of us. But her sister was a supervisor in the welfare department, and Aunt Annie successfully placed us in a beautiful foster home with wonderful, loving parents, very Christian people, and they raised us. But at the time that I had, uh, was about seven years old, uh, my character probably had already been set. I can recall, you know, when I was like three and four years old, I would take pennies off of the uh, newsstand and buy candy with it and milk bottles, you'd get a penny deposit on, little petty theft, things like that. And although uh, my foster parents raised us in the Christian church, we were baptized as Methodists, and she uh, tried to teach all of us the real values of uh, life, and um, yet I became a delinquent. And consequently, becoming a delinquent, I succeeded in getting into trouble during my early childhood and in my adolescence. And later on, I became associated with the gangs in Chicago and got more and more in trouble. I became a truant. I was sent to special ed. Wait a minute. We're going to stop him for a second. Okay. I want to 
wanted to uh, just take you back a little bit. What profession did your grandparents, did, did we talk about your grandparents? Yeah, well, my grandfather in Yazoo City, Mississippi, uh, I later went down there after family reunion with my sisters and nieces to sort of check on our roots, although I said I'd never go to Mississippi after Emmett Till was killed, but uh, later we did go, I did go down there in the 80s, and then we tried to find out some things about our grandparents. Uh, and my grandfather, he had a barber shop, and uh, it was black barbers, but they only worked on white people. And then I had uh, other relatives down there, Mary Oaks, whose son had married my grandmother's sister. And he had uh, uh, started an academy in his home. He was doing contracting work. His brother had a shoe factory down there. So they were doing very well in Yazoo City, Mississippi. And my grandfather, who apparently met my uh, grandmother, uh, because her sister, had, they were born in Alabama. And when John Oakes married my grandmother's sister, I guess my grandmother came to visit and met my grandfather, who was Thomas uh, Jennings. Okay. And he had, uh, he and my grandmother, they had four children, two sons and two daughters, which was, yes, which was Thomas Boise Jennings. And uh, they had Ruth was, uh, one of the other sisters. And during that time, uh, down in Mississippi, as I said, they had nice homes. And it was only because of the incident with my father that caused them to have to leave Mississippi. Well, we found out from a book that was on the library uh, this information that I'm talking about right now. My niece, who is a professor, she's uh, the daughter of my sister, and uh, her name is Patricia Taylor. She is a professor, a tenured professor at Laverne University. She has been voted Professor of the Year. She's currently in the process of getting her doctorate. My other niece is Karen, my sister's daughter, and she is a physician, a family physician, right now working at a HMO in Palmdale, California. So my sister did very well in educating her daughter. Karen was graduated from Case Medical School here. But uh, going back to what happened down in Mississippi, the uh, brother of John Oakes was found dead in the, uh, in the river down there. I think they call that the Yazoo River. And uh, we don't know exactly what happened to him, but he did have a shoe factory. We later learned that there was a, a Jennings, a white man that was very wealthy, that owned a lot of factories and things. And during slavery time, our parents were probably uh, slaves to this Thomas Jennings. He had the same name as my grandfather what the relationship was because my grandparents are very, were very fair looking people, both my grandmother and my grandfather. I mean, they look very Caucasian. So whether or not they, he was the son of this here uh, plantation owner and industrialist, we don't know because it could possibly be uh, uh, because of the white blood in the family that it might have been from an overseer or one of his relatives. But anyway, that's as far as we could trace the ancestors of our grandparents. My grandfather came to, when he came to Chicago, uh, after, uh, the, when the Depression happened, he committed suicide. Uh, he was found, I believe, in the Chicago River, which devastated my grandmother, and she died shortly thereafter. Uh, he passed for white and, and, and so he could work downtown and make a living because at that time mostly blacks could only get menial jobs, janitors and things like that unless they had a profession as lawyers or doctors or something like that. 
but my grandfather being a barber and everything and being fair-skinned, he was able to uh, pass for Caucasian to make a living. And during the Depression, he lost what other wealth he had accumulated in Mississippi. And like a lot of other white people at the time, he committed suicide because I guess of depression and, and things like that, that that did that to him. But I remember going to his funeral. I was a young boy with my foster parents, and it was just terrible because he had been in the water a while, and they did they closed the coffin at the funeral, but uh, we visited in the back of the undertaker parlor, and he didn't even look like himself. So uh, that was a nightmare for me for a long time. And my poor grandmother, whose name was Alice, she was bedridden for a long, long time after that loss. So those were some of the tragedies early on in our family. Can you uh, tell us one more time your grandfather's name was? Thomas. Thomas. Thomas Jennings. Thomas Jennings. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, like I said, having been raised in Chicago. Just pause one second. Okay. Yeah. So we, we, I'll say for the camera that we are in Chicago, and that's where your grandfather passed away. And we, they came to Chicago because your father got in some trouble in Mississippi. Yeah, fighting with the white, fighting. with the white boy. And then they moved to Chicago, and yes. that's where your father, your grandfather, experienced the depression. Yeah, well, during the Great Depression, right. because uh, what property, money he had, it was all lost in the banks, and uh, things just wasn't going well. When my grandfather passed away, I was probably about eight or nine years old because I was in my, with my foster parents at that time. My mother had already passed away. Okay. Okay. She and passed away, with, I think, in 1930. I was about seven, sometime as near as I can remember. And then soon, sometime after that, your father passed away? Well, my, my, my father, no, he, he passed away in the 50s. Uh, I don't remember exactly uh, what month because I was incarcerated at the time that he passed away. Okay. And, and wh why did your mother pass away? Again? She had tuberculosis. And so was she treated for that? Yeah, she was in a sanitarium at the time she passed away. But shortly before she passed away, she was able to visit with us. Sometimes when people feel that they don't have long, they can get, get the strength to come out. And I remember the last time seeing her, she came to the house, because my foster mother would visit her every Sunday at the sanitarium. And she came to the house, but she could not hug or kiss us. She had to sit across the room from, from us. And I remember when she left, how she looked. She had on a little checkered coat and a hat, and she walked down 48th Street waving to us goodbye. And that was the last time we saw her alive. A few weeks after that, Mama, I called Mama, my foster mother. She uh, went out to visit her and came back with the bad news that she had passed away. It seems like you had a very loving foster family. Uh, that was the most uh, loving person. My foster mother, she did everything the right way in trying to raise us. And uh, as I said, when she became my foster parent. I was already probably set in my character of, uh, of doing delinquent things. My younger brother, I, I, I know that we had a problem with uh, not only depression, but other mental illness. And I think my father suffered from uh, a type of mental illness too. And for him to have been down there fighting with white boys in Mississippi because they always said that was a crazy Negro that would do something like that. But he did have a tendency towards violence. And he would preach to us about uh, standing up for our rights and fighting white people and things like that. And, uh, of course, my foster mother, she being a very Christian woman, you know, she would tell him when he'd come by to visit us, don't talk to the children like that, you know. And he said, I just want them to know that you just cannot stand around here and not do nothing to let white people run over you. And he always said, I remember he'd be talking about the race riot in Chicago and how he shot at white people. So, <laughs> Daddy, uh, and he was a very white-looking person, you know, but 
what had happened to him, I guess, had just antagonized him, you know, more or less against white people during the segregation and the lynching and the things that was going on. So I, I, I think uh, that may have had an effect on not only me, but my younger brother, James, because James worked in the post office, and he was a probationary employee. And he had a tendency when he was working to, you know, just speak his mind if he didn't like something going on. And he couldn't hold a job long because he would, you know, get in controversy with his supervisor. So when they fired him, he thought he was entitled to a civil service hearing. He's the first one that I ever heard of going postal. James made him some homemade pipe bombs and got a gun and a homemade bulletproof vest and, and went down to the on Clark Street to the old post office building and the post office and the federal court that was down there. And he shot up in the rotunda and barricaded himself. I, I was incarcerated at the time, and when I heard it on the radio, I, they didn't mention his name at that time on the early news. They just said they had a man barricaded down there that had shot up the courthouse. And uh, later when the news come on, I was shocked when they said it was James B. Jennings, 5111 E. 48th Street. And I told my cellmate, that's my brother. Well, <laughs> they later said James, uh, they know that they could not send him to the penitentiary to convict him because they, they discovered he was a paranoid schizophrenic. And he felt he had been persecuted and he was making his statement. So, uh, my brother probated him, and, and the FBI let him send him to Elgin Mill Hospital, where he stayed there and took shock treatment for two years, and he was released. And then he later came out, and he became sort of an activist against the war. Uh, that was World War II? Yeah, and, and, and got into that war movement, and, uh, but he was still very threatening. Was this in Chicago? Yeah, in Chicago at the time. And, uh, so James, you know, he had this serious problem. Other than that, he, you know, he wasn't a thief or anything like that. He had never committed any kind of a crime other than the fact that uh, uh, when he felt threatened or somebody uh, imagined that somebody was threatening him, he, he could become violent. Tell me, tell me this about So I think he inherited that gene or whatever it was from my father. And... Uh, so uh, James later. Uh, How did the shock treatment? Huh? Did that, what did the shock treatment do to him? Did it calm him down? Well, after two years, uh, my brother didn't. Uh, then they thought that you know he was uh, eligible for release from the mental hospital and could just take outpatient treatment. Uh, my brother didn't want to sign him out. So I had a lawyer friend of mine that I had been associated with while I was in the institution being a <laughs> jailhouse lawyer, you might say, to go and file a habeas corpus petition that he was a fit subject for release, and then consequently James got out. And at that time he became a disabled person, and, and he just received a dis uh, SSI or Social Security. But he could decorate and paint real good. He was slow but he would do a magnificent job, and, and uh, he would earn extra money doing that. But he never was uh, able to get what you might say gainful employment with any company with that on his record. Can you tell us, we, you, you mentioned something about being a jailhouse lawyer. Well, but how did you get to jail? How did you get to prison? Well, like I said, that I had become a delinquent. Right. And, and, uh, I got involved with the gangs in Chicago, and, uh, you know, we did the different thievery and, and, and consequently robbers that led up to that. I was always a good student uh, as far as I could learn well, but I, I, I was not, in the sense, a good student. Uh, I, I was a truant a lot of times, you know what I mean? I was rebellious, and so I was sent to a special school called Mosley, where they had strict discipline. What was the name of the school? Mosley School. And it was for, uh, it was run by the Board of Education in Chicago. And they would give you car checks to, you know, you could ride the streetcar, the elevator to school, and back there, give you free lunch. But they had corporal punishment. They would pal you if you were late. And they didn't tolerate, you know, no type of uh, delinquency at the school or bad behavior. 
And so that got my attention. The other schools, uh, you know, I, I would come to school or I'd just leave the classroom when I got ready if the teacher wouldn't dismiss me and, and things like that. But consequently, that got me sent to, uh, Scripture yeah. Well, so where were you living during that time? What, what part of Chicago? The were south you? side. You were living in south the south side, side of Chicago. Uh, well, yeah, well, we stayed at in Woodlawn, which was sort of an integrated neighborhood when we moved out there. The first, we stayed at, uh, on 48th Street. That was between a street called Vincennes and South Park at the time. South Park is now Martin Luther King Jr. Boulevard. So then we stayed at 4760 Champlain. Uh, that's my foster mother's, that was his father's, her father's home. And it was an old brownstone mansion, and he had a store there. So all of her relatives, and there were a lot of them, they bec we became an extended family to her relatives. Right. Uh, and and that, was, that was very good, too. Papa Baldwin, uh, her father, he, he owned a store, you know, and they had the migrated from Alabama and Memphis, Tennessee. So my mother had been educated at Tuskegee, my foster mother at Tuskegee uh, in Alabama. And uh, she was qualified to be a teacher. And she had one daughter. She had a son, but her son passed away before she became foster parents to us. But she had Lillian, a daughter. And uh, she became a foster sister. She was just like a sister down through the years to us. So a lot of people just thought that didn't even know about the foster yeah, they just thought we were the real children of uh, Annie James and, and Raleigh James, her husband. He worked on the railroad. He was a porter on the railroad at the time that they got us. And they were doing well. But during the Depression, Mama's brother, who owned this two-family house out in Woodlawn at 68 in Langley, uh, he lost his job during the Depression, and he couldn't keep up the payments of the house. So Mama moved in to take over the payments, and Dad, who still had his job, and they tried to hold the house together, and we lived there and went to school at Makaish Elementary School mm -hmm. at that time. But they eventually lost that house because during the Depression, Dad lost his job on the railroad, on the railroad and then uh, what we would do was sell vegetables to make a little extra money, and then he got a job on the WPA as a work project that Roosevelt has established. Mm -hmm. But later he was able to get back on the railroad uh, in the late 30s. So would you say during that depression time people really pooled their resources? They worked together. Yeah, well, it, it was amazing uh, to see how black families at that time were so united and close together. I remember they would take in their uh, relatives that would come up from the south, from the Rust Belt that was going on in Texas. My foster father and mother, they, uh, my foster fathers had some nephews, Roscoe, Bob, and Paul. They hoboed from Texas. He was born in Austin, Texas, my foster father. For the younger people that are listening to this, yeah. what does hobo mean? Well, they would just jump on a freight train and ride it until they got where they wanted to go. And this was very prevalent back during the Depression. It was nothing but of constant people hoboing on trains, going to different places, trying to find work, looking for a better life. And they thought if they came up north, it would be better for them because the south has suffered from that there drought and that rust belt thing. But they came up here, and in order to provide a place for them, they took the basement and built a little apartment down there. Uh, Bob was handy as a carpenter, you know, and they even made a front entrance to the basement. Okay. A and then uh, Paul got a job uh, caddying at a golf course, and uh, they were able, you know what I mean, to get little jobs, menial jobs that just paid a little money. But he, he had took his family in, and, and this was the way black people were doing when their relatives would come up to Chicago. Some of them didn't have enough room for the people to sleep, and they would sleep in shifts. When the kids would go to school, the old people would stay up all night listening to Phil Coy and Edwater Kent radios while the children slept. And when they would go to school, they would sleep in the children's bed <laughs> until the children come home from school. 
but black people were very loving and, 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 and caring, and you don't see that kind of love today uh, and, and unity. That was in the 30s during the Great Depression. I can remember, so I always say three of the greatest things that, that, that happened in my life that I went through were the Great Depression, World War II, and the Civil Rights era during the 60s. Those are the things that's most memorable to me because People don't realize, you know, the, the, the tragedy of that Great Depression. It was so many people that had lost their homes that were in poverty, you know, and it was like soup kitchen. And then Roosevelt came along and created jobs. The WPA, which only paid, I think, $13 a week, $26 every two weeks. But back then, you could get a room for three dollars a week, like a, a kitchenette room, and as I said, you could rent a two-bedroom apartment with heat for a dollar a day, thirty dollars a month. Wow. You know, but that was a lot of money to a lot of people that didn't even have that because they had to, you know, provide food. And then uh, he had the relief program going on. Ro Roosevelt was a, a, a big savior. He created the CC camp, something you don't see today. That was for young people on the street for a dollar a day and their room and board and clothing and everything, and they would send them all out into the West to, to help preserve the forest and things like that. But it provided some type of employment. It took these people off of the street. And they, you don't see them providing that kind of thing today, but that, that really helped because there were so many young people that were sent to these camps and got that $1 a day in their room and board, which were $30 a month. And like I said, that was enough money to rent a two-bedroom apartment, but they didn't need that. That, that, that one dollar was their pocket money. What if, tell me about church. Did you all go to church? Well, of course, we went to church. As I said, my mother was very religious. She was very knowledgeable about the Bible. She was a member of the Moody Bible Institute. And uh, we went to Sunday school. We went to junior church. She had us baptized. We were baptized when we were very young. And Reverend Winter's church was down on 48th Street. It was a Methodist church. She tried to teach us all of the religious values. And some of the philosophical things, that, even though I was a delinquent child, stuck with me down through the years. And I think they helped me down, down through the years. She, she, mother uh, had me able to repeat the 23rd Psalm uh, when I was very young, my oldest brother, he became king of the Sunday school. My oldest brother was a student. He learned to read when he was about four years old. I can remember my father, my real father, when he was teaching him to tell time. We'd be laying in bed, and, and I would ask him to be taught, and he'd tell me, not yet for you. But he would teach Henry, because my father was a, a, a good reader, too. And uh, he was also a good mathematician. He worked at, at, at the jobs he found was with the number barons and then the gambling joints. He was, uh, they nicknamed him Racehorse Slim, and he became a sheet writer and, and, and uh, betting by the Jones boys. They were the big number boys, and they ran the gambling houses. They were from Mississippi, and as long as he was sober, he, he was able to make some money and come by and, and, or, or buy us shoes and contribute a little something. But then because of alcoholism, he would fall off of you know, the wagon, or so to speak, and he, was, he, he wasn't able to function like that. But uh, the Jones boys liked him, and they took care of him. In the hospital, like they paid his hospital bill and everything when uh, he got hit by a cab. I guess he was disabled, you know, from alcohol or something. But those, those were the days that w I was exposed to. Seems like people really looked after people in those days. They did. It, it was amazing how they did uh, look out for one another, and there was so much discrimination was against us. Chicago, although it was in the north, Chicago still discriminated against black. We could only live in certain places in the ghetto, as we call it, or on the south side. We were confined to certain places. We could, black people couldn't live in none of the white hotels, you know although we could go to the same toilets and drink out the same fountains. But even at Jackson Park Beach in 1934, they had a rope extended down the lake. Well, to put it in proper perspective, on 31st Street Beach in Chicago and Lake Michigan, that was the only black beach in the whole city for Chicago. And Chicago got beaches that stretched for miles from the south side to the north side. But that was the only beach. But 
when black people sort of moved towards Jackson Park, like I said, we moved to Woodlawn and uh, a, a community called Woodlawn and Hyde Park was out at Jackson Park. We were uh, more near Washington Park. But in order to go to the beach nearest us, they had roped off a section of this white beach for blacks. They had, the white people had a big bathhouse, big beautiful bathhouse and everything there, but we were not allowed on that side of the beach. You say so. Were there any facilities for you? No. There were no bathrooms or facilities for us to go to. We just had a stretch of sand beach, you know, with just rope running down the lake. But we would swim under there sometimes and pull on the white boy's legs, you know, how kids are full of mischief and the police would run us back over to our side. So Paul, one of my foster father's uh, nephews, he had joined the Communist Party because of the Depression. All we could go to Washington Park and it was speaker stands out there. We didn't understand what they were talking about that much and didn't care as children, but my daddy called them Reds. But they were communists and they were preaching the overthrow of the United States because of the Depression and things like that. And when they would evict sometimes a black person from their home because they couldn't pay rent, they would go put the furniture back in and tell the landlord, if you put them out again, we're going to burn your house down. So Paul came back and said, don't let the children go to the beach this week. And Mama said, why? I said, because we're going out there and going to tear that rope out. And the communist people, they did go out there, I remember, I guess the communist people, and they tore that rope out uh, of that beach. The uh, they were communists. Were they white communists? Yeah, white and black. Because of, that's what the Communist Party would thrive on, something like this. Although in Russia, people over there, they used to laugh. I don't know if it was true or not, with eating boiling shoe leather. But they were using the Depression a as a opportunity to overthrow capitalism. And, and, and uh, those were some wild times. They, they did go out there and do that. So once the rope was removed, they didn't put the rope back up, but they would have this big Irish police when he would be standing at this demarcation line with his billy club, and if we went over to the white folks, he's now boys, back, back over there. But black people have a tendency to cluster among themselves anyway, because most of them wouldn't even venture over there. They, they would just uh, meekly stay on their side of the, the sand. <laughs> but people like, uh, yeah, rebellious people like myself, and the other kids, we would go over there a lot of times, you know what I mean, and, and, and play shark to the white boys. And we'd swim underwater and grab them by the ankles, you know, just playing and stuff. And, 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 <laughs> and then we would get run and back and the police would threaten to arrest us and things like that. But, uh, uh <laughs> It was some, quite some time. For uh, quite some time. Yeah, well, that, that made it very rebellious, you know, the... Uh, even discrimination. Mm -hmm. But later, my foster father would get uh, passes when he was on the railroad. He would get passes for us to go down to Florida, Alabama to visit mama's relatives. Mm -hmm. And we would get a free ride. Well, that exposed us, having been born and raised in the North, no sooner we get to Kentucky, we'd have to get in the, the, the back car. Oh. You know, that we could not be in the car with the white people. So, we were back there in the back car, and sometimes all the way to Florida, you know, we changed trains in Alabama. Sometimes we wouldn't have ice in our cooler, you know. We couldn't eat in the dining room. We'd have to take shoe box and lunch as Mama would. And when the plane would stop, uh, I mean, the train would stop at some station, we could buy for a nickel knee-high pop that the vendors would be out selling sandwiches and pop, more or less for the black people. This that, is the 30? That were in the, yeah, the Jim Crow cars. Now, that, yeah, Jim that was the Jim Crow cars that we had to ride that. So when they took me down to Florida, uh, it was a whole different ball game. It was Mariana, Florida, and, and that Mama had some relatives there, Uncle Willie, you know, and, and his wife, I think her name was uh, Claire, and then Kate lived in Cypress, Florida. Uh, he was a preacher. But then Cousin Madison, some more relatives of hers, that lived uh, in Mariana, Florida and had a 40-acre farm or something. We loved to go to the farm because we could ride the horses, the kids, and this was all a new life for us. But in town, uh, 
I discovered, you know what I mean, what discrimination was really like. My brother, the oldest brother, we were buying some postcards to send back home, and when the man asked him which one you want, he said, this one. And he said, my brother said yes to him. He walked around the counter. I thought the white man was going to hand my brother the card, and I think it only cost a penny for a postcard back then or something, but he slapped him and said, nigga, you're going to learn how to say yes sir to white people. And I called a man, an MF, and, and ran out the store. And so, <laughs> and then again, I got to, uh, at the ice cream factory, it wasn't a factory, it was a store. We went in there, and they knew that we were not uh, uh, Southerners in that respect, live around there. So the, the girl in there, I later found out she was the daughter of the owner who was not in there, when she was serving us ice cream cone, we would black people would have to take it outside and eat it. They could not eat ice cream in the store. But when she was asking us about Chicago and letting us eat our ice cream in the store, me and my oldest brother and her father came in, and my brother's brown skin, so I'm going to be a real light skin, got a straw hat on and everything down there. Uh, he pointed to him, and he said, don't you know you can't let this nigga's not supposed to be eating ice cream in here? you know, at my brother. And she said, well, they're from Chicago. And he said, they? She said, yeah, he and his brother. And he looked at me. And he said, oh, well, still, they, we don't let niggas eat ice cream in here. So you boys go on outside. And, uh... <laughs> Well, yeah, well, that's what they always call you. They, they couldn't say niggers a lot of them. They, they accent, they sound more like Nigras, these Nigras, <laughs> you know. So uh, I was constantly getting into trouble, and then it was a white boy that had a pony, a little black and white pony, and I asked him to let me ride it, and he said no. So when he went in the ice cream thing, I got up on his pony anyway and rode it around. When he come out, he got mad, and when he got off, he hit me and we started wrestling him and fighting to the ground and I got on top of him and uh, the white people just looked with well, Ray, which was the uh, grandson of Uncle Willie, you know. He was devastated. Yeah, he ran home to tell him I was fighting with a white boy. I was doing exactly, uh, but, but the white people apparently being, being, being light-skinned didn't take me for black down there because they just made us shake hand and I went on my way. But when I got home, they took a a switch, they get it off the peace tree and strip the leaves off of it, and I got a whipping, you know. It's all, all of this I just rebelled against. And then one time I, uh, we went to get some ice uh, out on the farm. You'd have to go maybe two or three miles to a filling station on the highway to get ice to make ice cream with. And so uh, I can't, his name was Timothy or Tim or something, but anyway, he was driving the buggy, and some old w w white man come along in a, t a Model T Ford and waved him off to the side. I don't know what that was about, but he was angry when Willie got off of the buggy and went to talk to him, and he slapped Willie, and then Willie come back. And I asked him, why don't you hit that man back? And he sort of had tears in his eyes. So I went and told my mother about it, and she said, you can't fight we pe white people down here. And uh, whatever that white man was mad at him about, you know, uh, and, and that didn't take well with me, that you couldn't fight back. Because your father had already told you. Uh, that's right. Well, that, that, was, that was in me. So I caught malaria down there from them swamps and uh, uh, almost died. My brother, too. You know, we would go out there. They'd have fish fries and stuff, and I guess the mosquitoes built us. And um, they had a place, what did they call that place? Crystal Lake or something. And... Uh, they had to take us home, so on the train I had a very high fever. Down there, the only thing they'd treat you with would put the elephant leaves on you and maybe give you some, a little quinine or something like that, but no three hospital. sixes. No, no there's a hospital for white folks down there. Yeah, uh, uh, you know, it wasn't any doctors. Everything done down there, uh, well, if they had black doctors or any doctor down there, if they didn't come to you, the, the hospital in town wouldn't take you. You know, that's how Bessie Smith died, what our great blues singer. They couldn't get her to a hospital down south, a white hospital, and she died. Well, the same thing on going back on the train. I had a high fever. And so the porter on the train,
told the conductor, and it was a white doctor that was up in the white section, and the conductor let him come back to look at me, and he gave Mama some quinine. I don't remember this because I was delirious at the time, and she was praying and say everything, trying to get me back to Chicago where they could get me in the hospital and my brother, but he wasn't as sick as I was going back on the train, you know, that the chills and fever that come with it. And so he said, well, you, if you don't hurry up and get this little, uh, whatever he called me, to, to the hospital, you know, he's very close to death. So Mama said she just kept praying, and when we got to Chicago, I was able to walk off that train. And uh, it's a funny thing about malaria. About maybe a year later, uh, I was in school, and I got the chills and fever, and the teacher sent me down to the principal's office. My brother was already down there with a relapse at the same time. Isn't that amazing? Right. <laughs> it takes you about 15 years, I guess, to get that out of your system. Now, how old were you when you had your first attack? At that time, I was been about 1934, or I would have been about 11 or 12 years old, okay. some, somewhere back then. So, uh, you had quite an experience, but you could see. But after that, 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 that sort of, when I saw firsthand the segregation and what they do to black people, uh, I really become intolerant of it, and I really became rebellious. And I guess that stuck with me all my life, you know. Not that I, I got any uh, hatred against white people, nothing like that. I, I, I don't hate white people. Or black people, or red people, or no kind of people. I dislike my enemy, and you can be black, and if you do something to hurt me, you're my enemy. If you're white and you do something to hurt me, you're my enemy. If you're Arab or Asian, that, I, I take it just on a personal level, how you treat me. Injustice. But, but that's right, but other than that, I have no hatred for no race of people. In fact, I feel that we're all one brothers and sisters, mm -hmm. but don't rub me the wrong way. I don't care what color you are, you know. So, uh, Can I ask you, when you, when you were in church, um, tell me, I don't remember hearing your foster mother's name. What was her name? Annie. Annie. Annie, Annie B. James. Her maiden name was Baldwin. Okay. And she married, her first husband's name was McCorkle, but that was uh, before my time. But I know my foster sister's name was uh, Lillian McCorkle. And what was your stepfather, your foster father's name? His name was Riley James. Riley James. Yeah. And and he was a good Christian man, and he was a good father. He took us and taught us how to swim, you know, and, and uh, we always had nice pets. And, and he, he was so supportive, even when the mother would have to wash with that old washing board, he would be washing clothes with her. He could cook. He was a good cook, too. And he would help around that house with all of the chores and everything. But uh, he wanted to make a living, and, and he had an old Dodge converted into a truck, and he would sell vegetables on that. We'd go to market, and we would help him with that, you know, so uh, you just chores? to make a living. You had chores to do as a child? We always had chores. Like, uh, Mama always insisted, like, we would wash the dishes and things that stuck with me. I can't get my grandchildren to do. You couldn't get up. When you get up on the table, you had to rinse all the dishes off. You could not put no dishes with food particles on it or nothing like that. You had to w get on your knees and do the kitchen and, and the bathroom because you wouldn't smear up the woodwork. Uh, otherwise, you'd be called back in. You couldn't go out. If you go out to play and she saw you didn't do the job right, and I would always do mine right. She would always try to encourage me, I guess, because she figured I had a problem. But being the most generous in the family, my brother, the oldest brother, was very sulky. He read a lot and he complained a lot, you know, uh, and, and Henry did, the oldest brother. But he was mostly with a stay at home type of guy, loved to play checkers and chess and things like that and to read. He's a very avid reader and a good student, and I used to make fun of him, you know, why he liked school so much, and I didn't. But, but, <laughs> not, but, he, but Henry, that was your oldest brother. Yeah. He, he was not the one that got in trouble. No, James. Okay, so the there younger was Henry, son. and then there was Calvert. Yeah, me and, and James. James was the one that uh, had the mental problem. So tell me, what kind of games did you play as a child? Well, uh, I played the regular games, you know, the baseball, uh, you know, football, the regular games uh, that, that children play uh, as we were coming up. But most of the time, I would love to be in the street okay. and, 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 to, and to run with the crowd. I wasn't the type of kid that wanted to stay at home, and, and I was the type of that was always, you know, ready to get into the mischief. 
to do, uh, to do mischievous things, you know. So uh, I became sort of wild like that. My mama done everything she could, you know, to uh, turn me against that. But once a child is set in his way, you can't watch that child 24 hours a day.